Well, good morning and good afternoon. Uh, um, I'm, uh, my name is Tony Andreu. I'm the Scientific Director of EATRIS, the European Infrastructure for Translational Medicine. And, um, and I would like to welcome you. I'm thanking, I'm thanking you also for uh, joining us in this uh, webinar. Well, Infrastructure for Translational Medicine and uh, uh, Critical Path Institute. Uh, well, you see on the screen a few uh, housekeeping um, items. Uh, first, just to remind you that this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available post webinar. Also, of course, there will be a Q&A session at the end, so please make sure that you put your questions in the chat box on the right. And uh, these questions will be viewable by everyone attending the webinar. And of course, uh, post-webinar communication will be sent answering all questions, including those that we didn't have time for today. Uh, also, please make sure that your video uh, should be off for the duration of the webinar. And also, uh, we'll ask you to remain on mute during the meeting. You see uh, some uh, email uh, addresses uh, if you want to, to ask for some specific information after, after the webinar. Well, we are going to start. Uh, we are going to start today. Um, as you know, this uh, this webinar uh, wants to present the capacities of the Rare Disease Cures Accelerator Data Analysis Platform, hosted by the Critical Path Institute, as a key element for the progress of the agenda of uh, the research in the field of rare diseases. So, but uh, maybe first, first, uh, first of all, and before. The speakers uh, would be interesting to just to give you a little bit of a very, uh, general overview of what the atris uh, of what the atris is um, the European Infrastructure for Translational Medicine. As I'm sure that most of you are not familiar with our organization, so Samantha, if you can show the first slide, please. Well, uh, uh, the atris is, uh, is the European Infrastructure for Translational Medicine. It's a European <laughs> multinational organization that um, uh, groups a group of uh, 110 research institutes in 13 European countries. And we present a group of facilities, resources and services that are available to the research community in the field of translational medicine. Uh, basically, our idea is to provide support bricks and brains with the idea of facilitating the access of cutting edge services to the European research area. Our capacities are structured around five scientific platforms, uh, namely uh, ATMPs, Advanced Therapy Medical Products, uh, Biomarkers, Imaging and Tracing, uh, and Small Molecules and, and Vaccines. And we, are an, uh, we have a legal entity that allow us to you know, to, to, to uh, act independently and to have our own, our own research agenda. Uh, can you show us the next slide, please? Well, uh, we are a disease agnostic organization, but our main goal is to provide tools for the progress of translational medicine. Understanding translational medicine as the process by which the knowledge generated by science is translated into practical solutions for the patients. And for that, uh, we need to support all the different stakeholders involved in this process, not only academy, but also industry, patient organizations, and also the policymakers. At the end of the day, our main goal is to accelerate the translation of research discovered into the benefit, uh, into patient benefit. So, uh, okay, um, you can show the last uh, slide. Anyway, uh, this is just a brief introduction. Uh, many thanks uh, again, as I said before, for joining us for this webinar. And we are going to give the floor to the first speaker. The first speaker is uh, Jane uh, Larkindale from the Critical Path Institute, who is going to introduce the characteristics and the trends of the platform. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony, and thank you uh, to Iatris as a whole for co-hosting this um, webinar with us. I'm really excited to be here to tell you a little bit more about the Rare Disease Cures Accelerator Data and Analytics Platform, which is a platform that's been set up to, uh, to really make data available across all rare diseases to the worldwide global commu research community to accelerate drug development. 
It's a project that um, that we launched about a year ago, a little over a year ago now, in collaboration with the National Organization for Rare Disorders, which is a US-based nonprofit, which looks across all rare disorders to try and really improve lives and accelerate drug development. So they're our partners in this project, and the project is funded through a collaborative grant with FDA, the US Food and Drug Administration, who are also extremely involved in the development of the project. So those are all the partners here, um, here in the US, but we all know that rare diseases are global. There are relatively small numbers of patients, and in order to really change anything in rare diseases, we have to think globally. So we're really excited to be here with the actress We've been partnering with the European Joint Programme for Rare Disorders on a number of different levels, and it's really exciting for us to have an opportunity to reach out um, to Europe and, and eventually to the world and um, all around the world to make this project a reality. In the next half hour, I'm going to give you some basics of what, what this platform is, where we are and where we're going, and what we hope to achieve with this extremely large project. Next slide, please. So just a little bit of background on who we are at the Critical Path Institute, which is really the home of this platform. We have been around for about 15 years. We're a nonprofit um, that was set up really to try and accelerate drug development across all diseases. We work through, um, through public-private partnerships, bringing different groups together, driving consensus, and really trying to um, seek regulatory endorsement of novel methodologies and drug development tools. Every one of our programs involves bringing stakeholders from across the community together to build consensus and to make co build concrete tools that can be used in drug development. In particular, we've always worked very closely with the regulatory agencies, FDA, EMA, and such like, to make sure that everything we do is going to be acceptable for regulatory science to drive drug development forward. Next slide, please. So these are a number of the programs we have at CPATH. You can see with their blue arrows were specific projects and specific rare diseases. And they were really the genesis of the RDC ADAPT that I'm going to be talking about mostly today. We had programs in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, sickle cell disease, Friedrich's ataxia, Huntington's disease, polycystic kidney disease. And it touched on a number of other rare diseases associated with the common disease that we work on. And looking at what we did as we built drug development tools in these areas, we all recognized that we were bringing, the first step of every consortium was bringing data together, integrating it, understanding that data, and then using that data to do whatever analysis was needed to really support drug development, whether that was building a model of disease progression, understanding the natural history, supporting the use of a specific biomarker or developing an endpoint. It always started by bringing data together and recognizing that across the world, there are over 7,000 rare diseases. We couldn't form a consortium for every one of them. But I think we and our colleagues at FDA all recognized if we could bring all that data together in one place, use it not only ourselves, but make it available to the whole rare disease community, we could really have an impact on how drug development occurs for these rare diseases. Next slide, please. And if we can bring that data together, we can not only learn in one, about one disease, but we can um, transfer learnings across diseases. There are a lot of rare diseases have similar symptoms, similar biomarkers can be used, similar, similar outcome measures can be used. So we're setting up our platform so we can learn not just about one disease, but about as many diseases as possible and use that data as efficiently and as effectively as possible, because we all know the value of rare disease data. We don't have many patients. We don't have much data on, on any one, one disease. But we, we decided to set this up to really try and pull all the information together into one place so we can learn as much as possible from it. So what we are is a platform that's intended to be a neutral, independent data collaboration and analytics hub to promote the sharing of critically important data across rare disease, really to accelerate the understanding of disease progression, natural history, and with the goal of optimizing clinical trial design and accelerating drug development. So that's what we're trying to do. We, we want to promote data sharing. We, we will help curate and standardize the data to, to make sure that it's findable, searchable, available to, um, to users. We allow access to the data so that people can use it beyond ourselves. And we're going to provide an analytics platform to help understand the data, use the data as best as possible. And overall, that's going to lead to a better understanding of uh, rare diseases. Next slide, please. So this is an infographic of what our platform is. Starting on the left-hand side, you can see we're interested in all kinds of different types of data. 
We don't generate new data ourselves, but we partner with people in the community who have data, whether that's from a clinical trial, a natural history study, an academic study of a biomarker or an endpoint, registry data. And as we move forward, we'll also be looking at things like genomic data and imaging data and data from electronic health records. We bring that data in, and I'll talk a lot more about that, but the process of bringing it in in a moment. We curate it and we sort it. So some data, some data will be tagged with standardized ontologies. Um, some will be standardized into standard formats. That depends on the nature of the data. We'll bring it in and we'll, uh, um, and we'll make that data available. Some of it will be in a more structured format. Some of it will be in a less structured format, but either way, it will be accessible by both our team and outside researchers with the goal of really using that data to build actionable rare disease drug development solutions. Next slide. So what are we going to do? We're going to bring data together, we're going to share it, we're going to provide analytical tools, and we're going to help the community use the, use the, um, those data to help to support outcome measures and biomarkers, understanding of disease progression, understanding of natural history um, data, and help support the analysis of data to aid, aid in the design of, of novel innovative clinical trials to support rare disease research. Next slide. You can keep clicking a couple of times, Samantha. So the idea of this, in, ter um, in terms of the eventual use case, is we input all of this data that we're collecting from all around the world, as much data as we can. We can use analytics, in, this, in the case of the slide, particularly disease modeling, to look at changes in the disease. And then as an output, we have actionable knowledge. Maybe it's a model of disease progression. Maybe it's understanding the dynamics of an outcome measure. Maybe it's understanding how a biomarker changes and how that correlates with disease outcomes so we can use that biomarker. Maybe we're predicting trajectories in a variable co um, population, and we can build things like web clinical trial simulation tools. Next slide. I'm going to take you through an example of some work we did in Duchenne muscular dystrophy as an example of a rare disease where we've done some of this. Because I know when I first heard of the work of CPATH, um, I was questioning, in a rare disease, is any of this possible? There's only so much data out there. How can we do this? And um, I think we've shown in Duchenne it's very possible, and I think this can be really taken across other rare diseases, more common ones, less common ones. There's a lot we can learn just by bringing together the data we already have. So the Duchenne Regulatory Science Consortium came together with really with the question of trying to understand natural history of disease, understanding the population-wide variability in disease progression, because it's a very variable disease. We wanted to understand subpopulations of patients, and we wanted to really be able to design clinical trials that would actually show statistical significance and demonstrate whether drugs work or not. Next slide. Unfortunately, in Duchenne, we have, well, fortunately in Duchenne, we have a number of drugs in development, and unfortunately in Duchenne, almost no clinical trials ever reach statistical significance, and that re results in a great deal of tension in the community as to whether drugs work. To sort of start this project, we needed data. You can't model a disease without data, and this is exactly what RDCA DAP is going to be doing across diseases. We now have 20 different data sets in-house at CPATH, which we've been using for this work in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. This just list them, some of these are natural history studies, some of them are clinical trials. We are immensely grateful for, to the people who have shared data with us to make this possible. I think what's unique in Duchenne is the fact that many of these data sets are very small, so it involved bringing in quite small data sets, really managing the data, making sure we could integrate it appropriately to build a data set. We ended up building a, an analysis data set of uh, 1,139 patients, which corresponds to 24,000 observations, and a separate validation data set, so 364 patients and 2,600 observations, which for a rare disease is pretty good. If you think that this can't be done in diseases less common than Duchenne, we have a similar size database in Friedrich's ataxia, which is a less um, common disease. It's certainly not going to be possible in all diseases. There are some rare diseases where there are only 30 or 40 patients in the world, but by bringing the data together from around the world, we really could build a solid database for analysis. And we've been able to use that data in quite profound ways. Next slide. So our goal was to understand disease variability. And I think the slide really demonstrates what, what we mean by that variability. If you look at any one of these graphs, each of those little circles is an individual observation. And each of the graphs represents a different endpoint used um, in Duchenne studies. And I think the main thing you can take away from all of this is it's a mess. There's a great big hairball of dots 
It's very hard to understand. But when you look at it, there are trends. In almost every endpoint, there's initially an increase in strength. Then there's a de decrease in strength that increases in the very young patients who are growing and developing, and then a decrease due to disease. Um, it's very variable, um, but there is a natural progression of disease. And what we wanted to do is understand in the population the causes of that variability, or at least some of the causes of the variability, so you could choose the ideal population for a trial and understand what in those patients was likely to happen over the course of a trial. So you could design a trial that would actually reach statistical significance if a drug worked. So we took all of that data, and th those are just correlations with age, and built mathematical models of disease. Next slide. Our quantitative medicine team built some quite advanced mixed effects models and really tried to look at how things changed over disease and what were the covariates that affected that rate of change. If you click again, we found this is for one, one of those endpoints, force vital capacity, that we found that baseline score and ba baseline age were very important covariates. Race and the type of mutation in that particular patient affected certain aspects of the, of the model. And we found that our models described the population really quite well. Next slide. I right, click again. So, so on this, this image, you can see, again, this is just force vital capacity against age. You can see the, solid, um, the dotted lines are the actual observations of the data, and the, and the solid lines and colors are, are the simulations. So you could really see our models describe the data quite well, both in terms of upper limits and on, on the average. Next slide. I think the next slide shows a, a slightly different depiction um, of, of this, this is lo um, looking at a different endpoint where red is your typical average patient. Green, you can see patients who are using steroids, which are a common, a common treatment in Duchenne. They reach a higher maximal score before they decrease. And then patients with certain muta mutation groups reach a higher score and progress a little more slowly. And people who are both on steroids and are in that mutation group um, progress even more slowly and reach an even higher level. So we're just starting to describe different populations of patients whose dynamics and of change of this outcome measure uh, are somewhat different. And this helps us understand the disease population as a whole and helps us design better clinical trials. Next slide. So we've built these models of five different endpoints that are used in Duchenne trials and then built them into what we call, we call a clinical trial simulator. This is just a graphic image of that simulator here where the user can come in and enter what they think their trial is going to look like. So how long the trial is, how often you're going to make observations, um, how many patients you're going to put into your trial. The baseline features of your, of your population, whatever your inclusion, exclusion criteria are, you can dial those in. And then you enter what you think the drug is going to do based on preclinical work. Now that's an assumption because you don't know until you've done a trial what your drug is going to do. But you guess based on the best of your knowledge, earlier trials, preclinical data, whatever it is. And they, and then you hit simulate. This is, uh, the models will then be run based on those on um, the inclusion criteria that you've run, and it will tell you over the course of the trial that you've just said, I think I want to design this. It'll tell you what it looks like, what your drug arm data will look like, and what your um, placebo arm will look like. The nice thing there is you look at it and say, great, at the end of this trial, I'm going to st see statistical significance if my drug does what I think it's going to do. Great, I'll go off and run my trial. But if you don't see that, you can think about it some more, say, maybe I need to run my trial for an extra three months. Maybe I need a few more patients in this trial. Maybe I need to change my inclusion exclusion trial uh, criteria. But you can really play around with all those parameters to understand uh, what your trial should look like before you ever, ever lay hands on a patient. So you can really optimize the design of that trial in silico on your computer before you before you touch a patient. And this should lead us to much more efficient, much more effective clinical trials. Next slide. So that's one detailed example of why we want to do this. Why do we want to bring data together? It's because we want to be able to do things like that. We want to be able to build informed clinical trials. Here's another example. Well, this one happens to be in polycystic kidney disease, where we looked at a total kidney volume as a prognostic biomarker for polycystic kidney disease and really identified how to use this biomarker in polycystic kidney disease trials. This has now been accepted as a reasonably likely surrogate endpoint by the FDA, and drugs have been approved based on the, on the models on this biomarker, which is based on the models from combined data. If you click again, another example, and this one's in Parkinson's disease, clearly not a rare disease, 
where we looked at a different biomarker. In this case, it's dopamine pos transporter positive patients. We could see the people who are positive for this dopamine transporter um, behave differently. Their disease progresses differently. And if you use it as an enrichment biomarker, you can reduce this n number of patients in your trial and really study drugs in fewer patients in less time in early disease. So that's another example. And fi uh, my final example, if you click again, again, this is Alzheimer's disease. It's, not, it's a more common disease where they built a more, an even more sophisticated clinical trial simulation platform than we have in Duchenne, where you could really look at not just size of, size of trial and length of trial and inclusion and exclusion criteria. You could really look at different um, trial designs. Should you do a crossover design or a parallel design or a delayed start trial? What is the most efficient trial design for your therapy based on what you know about it? All of these examples are based on bringing data together. This is why for the Rare Disease Cures Accelerated Data and Analytics platform, we want to bring data together across rare diseases. Next slide. By bringing that data together, we can build these kinds of tools. We can accelerate drug development and we can really move rare disease drug development forwards. But it all comes back to data. Data is important. Um, you can't do anything without data. You can click one more time, please, Samantha. Um, why would people share data with us? I've already mentioned we don't collect new data. We're asking you to share your data with us. Why? Because you want to use it too. Uh, the concept behind the RDC ADAP is sharing data back with the community so we can all use it. In the case of academia, it really will improve your research. You can understand the disease course and the variance better. You can use it to develop biomarkers and endpoints just like we can. And you'll publish more and better papers to be able to develop new collaborations and really drive your research forwards. Industry um, loves this model. That's how all of our consortia have been, because the more data means designing more effective trials. Fewer patients, short time, that all saves money. Less risk. Share, sharing your data and being able to use it in, uh, in combination with other people's data will really drive drug development forwards. And last but certainly not least, patients and patient groups um, benefit from, from this because it leads to faster and more efficient drug development. It helps understand the disease course, provides visibility to industry. If, if there's data available in a platform like ours and industry can use it, they're much more likely to go into an individual disease area because they understand how to run a trial. And of course, it drives collaboration, which is at the heart of everything we're doing. Next slide. Just to prove that we can do this, this is just the data that we've brought in and shared at CPAR through the years. We have about 140,000 patients worth of data across various diseases, both rare and not rare. Next slide. And specifically, uh, no, this is, I forgot I had the slide in here. Patients are very willing to share data, particularly in rare diseases. This is just a number of studies that have come out over the past few years about what patients um, feel how patients feel about sharing data. If you click one more time, it's very clear that patients, and particularly patients with rare diseases, um, really are interested to, in sharing data. They're willing to share data, but they obviously have certain conditions about it, as we all do, that they really want to minimize their risk, make sure, maximize patient privacy, make sure the data is secure, make sure there's responsibility and accountability, and, other, and various other concepts that could, uh, clearly important to everyone. Next slide. So how can we do this? RDC ADAP has spent a lot of time working on how best to make sure we can maximize the sharing of data with our platform without making it such a complicated process that it takes three years to access the data the other way. And we do this by balancing the permissions and conditions for sharing the data. So that's what, how we share, it, share the data with the people who have collected it with the permissions and conditions for using the data, which is what we, we ask of people who, who request for access to our data. Next slide. And we've spent a lot of time working with the community, interviewing different stakeholders, and making sure that our data governance works on both sides of the, uh, uh, of the cards, sharing and uh, allowing people access. We share data at, a, at the level of individual data sets, where we put in place a legal agreement called a data sharing agreement with each individual data custodian, the collect, collector of each set of data. And we make sure in that document that we, we both give the custodian some control over their data and make sure that it was collected ethically. And I can talk in great detail about, about all of this, but essentially we make sure that the patients have given consent that is, we're able to share the data 
We have to make sure the data is de-identified. We do not work with identifiable data. And importantly, we, we, uh, we detail out exactly how the data can be used, who we can share it with, under what circumstances we can share it with, and what approvals we need before the data can be shared. So that is a detailed agreement that works on a data set by data set agreement, recognizing that each custodian has their own needs. Some people want their data shared with everyone. Some people want to approve who shares the data. Some people in their consent language have allowed sharing with academics and nonprofits, but perhaps the, the patients did not give consent to pharma companies and we need to respect those things. So that's all documented in the data sharing agreement and those terms carry over to how we can share the data. Next slide, please. So we're also working um, through the system as we bring the data in, we do a, a bunch of data explorations and mappings and standardization, and we provide feedback back to the custodian. So if it's an ongoing data collection, perhaps we can improve the next iteration of data. Perhaps you collect a certain endpoint in a different way than anybody else in your disease community, we can provide that feedback. If you're not using standardized terminologies, we can work, we can work with you on that. And we can make sure that you have, a, have access to your data, hopefully with other people's data combined as well. Next slide. Um, this is the data we have in the database right now. Um, this is uh, increasing dramatically since I made the slide, two more data sets have come in. I think we have about 25 data sharing agreements currently under review, but this is where we really want to grow. We have currently have um, data on about 12 diseases. There are 7,000 diseases out there. I would love to work with any of you to bring your data in, share your data, and combine it with other people's and make it available. Next slide. So the other side of things, once you've brought the data in, we've made it available. Obviously, people want to use the data. They get access to the data depending on how it was shared with us. We can share it with anyone we're allowed to share it with, sometimes after review, sometimes, sometimes immediately. But any user of our data has to sign terms and conditions of use of the data to make sure it is, um, it is kept private, ensure, uh, secure, and kept in secure data storage, make sure that the use is limited to whatever has been approved for that data set. It requires acknowledgement of the data source and public disclosures. So if you publish a paper, you may be asked to acknowledge our database. You may be asked to acknowledge the original source of the data as well. And it really ensures ethical use of the data and making sure that the, um, the data is not sold or shared onto other users. It's only used as permitted, permitted. And as we encourage public disclosure of all results. This is a government funded database open to the public, we're not charging for use of data, and we um, and therefore other people shouldn't either. Next slide. Obviously, that's only a subset of our terms and conditions of use, and we're happy to share copies of both our data sharing agreement and the terms and conditions of use as people are needed. So let's take a step back and think about this whole platform in the ecosystem of rare disease data. We're bringing data in from um, individual studies from groups, from registry systems, from electronic health records, and hopefully in the future, all sorts of other data sources as well. We're working with the data. You can click again, please. We're working with the data, we're sharing the data, but we're also feeding back into the community. I already mentioned that we provide feedback on the data sets we bring in to hopefully improve overall standardization of data, use of standardized ontologies, use of standardized um, data elements so that in the future, the ecosystem of rare disease data improves and gets better. We, of course, provide back data for analyses, both we can use it and other people can use it. And we're sharing our tools and analyses and uh, all, everything we're doing back with the community. So over time, this can be what one of my colleagues likes to call a learn and confirm model. We, we take what there is, we improve it, we feed it back, we get better data, and overall, we build a positive feedback system where we can develop more efficient, develop, uh, more efficient tools and develop new therapies more quickly. Next slide, please. So this is, this is just another, another image of our system, thinking about it from the point of view of a user. If you look on the far right, we have a number of different interfaces. At the highest level, you'd be able to come in and use what, what we call a data interrogator, search through the data, understand what data is there, do some basic, basic statistical analyses, understand if the data that you're interested in doing for your analysis is available. 
If it is, you can then go in, identify a subset, a subset of the data in our total database that you're interested in, at which point you request access. Some data may be immediately available. You'll be asked to sign ter the terms and conditions of use, and you can immediately go in and use the data either within our system or depending on permissions, you may be able to download it and use it on your own computer. If, they, uh, if the data you've requested requires approvals through either our data use committee or our data use committee and the original custodians, it'll take a little longer. You will submit a short research request describing what you want to do. It'll be approved by the appropriate users, and then you'll have access to the data. Again, you may be able to use it only within our platform, or you may be able to use it, um, download it and use it externally as well. Where are we with this? Uh, this is some pictures from our platform. It is still being built, but it's going to be available and accessible in um, within the next few months, at least for the first testing, and will be available before the end of the year to all users. Um, we're really excited about what the platform can do already, and it's got the beautiful aspect that within our base platform, you can keep adding new modules and adding your own programs and your own analytics tools and sharing them with the community. So the functionality will get better and better over the years. Next slide. So where we are now is we've, we're just about finished building the platform, which as I say, should be available this year. We're bringing in data very rapidly. We are always looking to work with the community. We'd love to hear from you if you have rare disease data you're willing to share or are interested in adding to the system and making available. We're always looking looking for, um, to hear from the community where there are priorities where people really need data, understanding what analytics people need, understanding how we can help you drive drug de development forwards. We'd love to hear from all of you. Rare diseases are international. We have far too little data anywhere, so bringing the data together and working together is imperative to move the, these projects forwards. We're a nonprofit. We're obviously not trying to profit out uh, um, from any of this. This work is all funded by the Food and Drug Administration um, and will be going, for, going forward. So thank you very much for your time. Um, I've seen a number of questions coming in in the chat as I've been talking. I do not have the ability to read and chat at the same time, so I'm looking forward to answering those in the Q&A. And with that, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Amanda Borens, who's the Executive Director of Data Science at CPATH. And she's been absolutely instrumental in building the platform. Today, she's going to be talking to us specifically about some of the things we've put in place to allow us to share data with the EU. Um, we all know that GDPR has very strict regulations around data sharing. And Amanda's going to talk to us some more about how this will work and how what, and the various solutions we have to make sure we can share, uh, share data internationally. Thank you very much. And Amanda, over to you. Thank you, Jane. Hi, everybody. I, as Jane mentioned, I'm Amanda Borens. I represent the data science team within our data collaboration center. So our work is very focused on making data fair, meaning that we want it to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And that involves a lot of technology solutions, basically, for aggregating data and making it interoperable and semantically, uh, making sure that we're standardizing and integrating data in a way where the semantic, semantic meanings and metadata are also preserved. Uh, before I proceed with talking about GDPR, I just want to point out that you can all uh, put your questions into the chat. We'll have a Q&A at the end, and we'll be mining that chat box for questions, some of which might be answered by follow-on talks. But we're also recording this webinar, so we'll be sending a link at the end to let everyone be able to go back and review the recording, um, not just the presentations, but also the discussion during the Q&A. So with that, I'll, I'll get started talking a bit about um, GDPR and how it affects our data sharing. Um, so just a little background. I have noticed that data sharing always, obviously, especially when we're talking about healthcare data, is a complicated and, and ethically a large responsibility, right? Sharing data that has some effect on, a, on an individual human being's health um, is a big responsibility, and it's one that we at CPATH take quite seriously. We're, we're um, very proud in the Data Collaboration Center of our stewardship of data and keeping it secure and keeping it private. 
But the, the, um, the entire landscape has changed, and especially there were two momentous um, issues with sharing data regarding human health. And the first one was the uh, HIPAA privacy law that took, that took effect in the U.S. many years ago, actually. That one is complicated in that it, it requires a lot of particular measures for stewardship of medical data. The thing that makes it a little bit less challenging than GDPR is that HIPAA is focused exclusively on healthcare data, whereas GDPR is much more broad and has um, maybe the ability to be open to interpretation in ways that HIPAA is actually much more prescriptive and specific. So I'm gonna focus um, in the next slide on what specifically brings challenges based on GDPR, Samantha. Thank you. So, so GDPR has many principles that apply to global data sharing, but let me just take a moment to recognize that GDPR applies to your data in Facebook, your data in social media, for example, your data in any sort of study or survey that has nothing to do with healthcare. So websites that have your information, um, all of those things are covered in order to give European Union citizens particular rights to their own private data. Now, that brings a particular challenge when we're working with medical data because the breadth of this, um, the breadth of these regulations leave it a little bit more open to interpretation, as I said, but especially it gives room to people when we're talking about science and medical data, it gives room for people to pull back and not share data as openly as we would like. Next slide. So I'm going to talk specifically about a couple of the things under GDPR, definitions under GDPR that especially affect data sharing. And the first one is the definition of personal data. We in the Data Collaboration Center for 15 years now have hosted data. And one of the most important things that we decided very early on is that we would de-identify medical data in order to make it much more unlikely that there was any sort of negative impact for a person who was in a study that, that is being hosted by the Critical Path Institute. And so de-identification under um, HIPAA means that we don't have any information about the the person's identity. We have things like gender and age, but we also have just, uh, you know, a randomly generated number that identifies each patient so that they can be tracked from uh, one incident to another, one visit, for example, to another visit. But what GDPR says is personal data has become a little bit more complex. So there's no safe harbor for de-identification. Um, and what that means is that we go to extraordinary measures, especially for dealing with European Union data or data that contains um, records for an individual European Union citizen. And so there's no safe harbor, which means that identifiability is much more open to interpretation. And so before I go on, I, I would like to cover kind of the worst case scenario um, that has been used to identify, or sorry, define personal data and whether or not it's identifiable. And that is that um, there are ways to get around this concern. One is that we can use uh, organizations who are specifically building in um, mathematical models for assessing risk versus benefit of sharing these data. And that has been used in some cases to say, okay, well, we as an organization owning this data, we, or at least being custodians of this data, we have decided that we will take no risk. And what that means is that we have seen data sets that have been de-identified to the degree that they are no longer scientifically useful. So an example would be that if you get medical data, but you have no gender, no age, no other demographic information about the patient, it makes it quite difficult to build a disease progression model, obviously, right? So that's sort of the worst end of the spectrum. Um, but we do have some options for pseudonymized data, and, and I'll talk about that in the next slide. So the definition under GDPR for processing sort of overlaps with this, meaning that 
anything that we're doing at CPAP is actually specifically requested to the definition of processing under GDPR, meaning that we want to collect and, and um, uh, store the data. So we haven't actually recorded the data, but we are storing and sharing the data and aggregating it with other data. And all of those things sort of fall within this definition of processing under GDPR. But there are a couple of things that I want to point out at this particular point, and that is that the spirit of GDPR is very definitely not to prevent medical and scientific advancement. In fact, there are some places where definitions are given that tell us that GDPR is here to help protect privacy of data, but it is absolutely not going to hinder scientific and medical research. And we have a couple of really good um, proofs of of concept, meaning that we host quite a bit of data that have been transferred from the European Union to the United States, specifically um, to be aggregated in a database for, for di everything from diabetes to Parkinson's to Alzheimer's disease. We've also transferred data collected in the US into the European Union. So we have um, confidence that all of these restrictions are not something that will prevent us from doing the good work that we do. Uh, so. You'll notice, especially in this slide, that the um, the European Data Protection Board has indicated that secondary research is considered compatible with the initial purpose of the trial. So, for example, if a patient in the European Union participates in a trial and they give consent to have their data collected, it's assumed, we can assume that the secondary research that aligns with the original purpose of the trial, for example, studying Parkinson's disease or studying Friedrich's ataxia, more specifically to rare diseases. So that, that means that we're safe to assume that if a person participated in a clinical trial or study related to a rare disease, we can continue to, to have secondary use of those data when we're studying rare diseases. Next slide. So a big part of this whole um, concern as far as technology solutions for transferring and, and hosting and keeping data secure is really um, that GDPR says you need to have a legal basis in place to transfer personal data. And so that means that um, a, a few things that we acknowledge in our legal agreements. One is that the, the, the regulations apply to data collected in any jurisdiction if the data contains citizens um, information about citizens of the European Union. It also covers data that's collected in the European Union and meaning that um, it should not be transferred outside of the European Union without a legal agreement in place. And so it is possible to transfer physically data from the EU um, if we meet certain requirements. And so <clears throat> we have actually quite a bit of uh, experience with signing legal agreements that we call our DCA. Next slide, please. So our approach to GDPR is to use what we call our DCA or data collaboration agreement, which is a legal document that we individually negotiate with a data custodian. And each, each DCA is modifiable in order to meet the concerns about risk for the particular data custodian in question. Um, as I mentioned, we have data from, from, we have examples of successful legal agreements that have allowed us to transfer data. We also have examples of data, unfortunately, that we were not able to obtain specifically because the data custodian was not willing to take on any risk at all as far as re-identification of patient data. Um, but I think under, under this discussion about our data collaboration agreement, you'll notice a few things. One is that we've, can, we've satisfied the issue of having a legal agree, agreement in place, but also we make sure that all of the risk is um, acknowledged and that both CPAP and the data custodian are protected by this legal agreement, meaning that it's really about mutual benefit and making sure that we're all completely transparent with whatever risk we're um, taking on as far as re-identification of patients. Probably the most common scenario for us um, in transferring data from the EU has been that we have the option of using a version of pseudonymization, which is not covered as um, a safe harbor, but what we do is have a unique key code that's assigned to the patient records 
And then the data custodian destroys that special key code that they've given us, meaning that in addition to the fact that we have coded data, there is no key that's available to re-identify those codes, right? So there are many ways that we've been quite creative and, and successful in meeting the requirements of GDPR, but also making sure that we're um, uh, being ethical and, 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 and encouraging the aggregation of medical data, honestly, in order to move science forward. Next slide, please. So why do we need to overcome these legal challenges? And Jane talked about this quite a bit and very eloquently, but, but I will summarize again that we cannot afford to leave rare disease data in silos around the globe. There are so few patients and such a dearth of data that there's really no value in having tiny little data sets in many different locations that are kept in silos, right? So I think collectively it, it's, the onus is upon us as, um, as scientists and as, as healthcare minded people to make sure that we're doing everything we can to share data about rare diseases. And I mean, a particular point for me, especially as a data scientist is that integrated standardized data allow us to generate hypotheses and new information in ways that may not have been predicted by the original study designers, for example. And so one of the, a couple of the examples that I give um, that I think are really impactful is that when you combine data for different rare diseases, it's possible that your individual disease, because there are seven or 8,000 recognized rare diseases, it's possible that your individual disease as a patient has not been rigorously studied, but there are also other ways that we can be more creative. So we can look for things like diseases that share similar phenotypes or progressions. Do they have a similar genetic basis? And in cases where there's no actual origin in common with the diseases, but the symptoms are in common, we can look at things like medications or um, therapies that have been helpful in treating particular symptoms for a patient with a rare disease that has not been studied in other ways. Next slide, please. I think a particularly good example of how collecting and aggregating data can be impactful for a patient with rare diseases is here. And this is one that is particularly moving to me because this, this adorable little girl that you can see on this slide, she has a rare condition that causes epilepsy and affects her movement and her development. Uh, she had many standard genetic tests that were negative for particular variants, but when consulting a large aggregated database of various SNPs or mutations um, in the human genome, scientists were able to decide that actually she had a particular set of variants that were quite different from her parents. And by using this massive database of different um, genomics variants and their effects, she's actually being treated successfully with a ketogenic low carb diet. And so it's a beautiful example of how this patient with a rare disease did not access a database of particular records about her specific disease, but actually accessed a database of aggregated data across many others. And so I think the beauty of aggregating data in this way is really told by this story because it means that we won't even, as data scientists, my job is to make sure that the data are available and accessible and searchable, but specifically not focusing on aggregating of data by disease or therapeutic area, because what we wanna do is really encourage this kind of creative discussion. Next slide, please. So I've talked a lot about GDPR and how it presents challenges, but what are the solutions? And, and I'm going to talk in two categories of solutions. The first category of solution is that we can keep the data within the EU. So the RDCA DAP itself, specifically the platform that we're building for rare diseases, is actually hosted within Amsterdam, meaning that if a data contributor gives us access to data, they don't need to physically move it out of the EU. So I've talked a bit about how we can use legal agreements and interpretation to justify transfer of data with with um, de-identification, but it's also possible if that's a risk that you're not willing to uh, or able to overcome, that we can keep the data within the EU. And so we have a cloud-based platform, which allows us to access it and researchers around the world to access it, but without physically moving the data out of the European Union. Um, we also are able with cloud-based technology 
we're able to um, make sure that it's absolutely secure because I think that um, many of us have learned that uh, using cloud-based solutions and those data centers are far more secure and protected than we can physically protect them at our office at CPATH, for example. Um, the other thing that we're really focused on is bringing the tools for analysis to the cloud, meaning that we, we are working very hard on using whatever technology tools are available to make sure that the data don't have to be moved at all. So, so it's stored in Amsterdam, but you don't need to download the data in order to do your analysis because we're providing tools like R and Python and Jupyter Notebooks and R Shiny and many other um, licensed tools. And we're putting those in the cloud environment with the data so that the data can can be minimally moved um, and, and in fact, not moved at all in most cases. Next slide, please. So the final um, kind of technology solution here that I think is becoming much more relevant in our discussions is the idea of keeping data where it lives, but also building a network basically, if you will, of um, data access so that the end user sees data as if it's in one location, but that they are actually accessing data that is physically stored in multiple locations. And so this graphic represents databases on different continents, right? But there are two ways that we can build this network and probably um, API access or application interface access is one that we're all familiar with. There are challenges associated with an API, meaning that um, the data might not be standardized or annotated in the way that I have done with all of the data that I'm hosting in my location. Um, but, but certainly API access is a way to make sure that, especially if there are no physical concerns with moving the data, we could query and return the data and then perform curation and standardization on the receiving end. Um, obviously that doesn't completely over concern, overcome concerns about moving data from EU jurisdictions. So the second kind of um, concept and one that I'm actually advocating for quite strongly in many cases is the idea of federated access to data. And the thing that makes federated access different from an API or a simple API is that you need to have a shared data model, meaning that there have to be agreements in place about common data architecture and standardized use and um, standardized metadata collection, for example, but also standardized use of controlled terminologies or data standards for common data elements. So all of that is um, gets much more into the technology realm of things, but it is absolutely a solution for sharing data around the world. And it simply requires that we come together and make some decisions as a community. Next slide, please. So thank you so much. Um, I think we can go to the next slide again, Samantha. Um, again, please put your questions in the chat. And I'm very honored to introduce now our Chief Executive Officer and President of the Critical Path Institute, Dr. Joseph Sheeran. Thank you, um, uh, Amanda. Um, so um, I'm the, um, the CEO of uh, the Critical Path Institute since about two years. And I'm going to talk from a different perspective because um, Jane and, and Amanda gave you a very good overview about the RDCA DAP and also Jane introduced to you what the CPAT Institute is about. What I want to talk about today is about the uh, data sharing, why we need data sharing um, and collaboration in order to move the whole field of rare diseases forward. Next slide, please, Samantha. So if we look at the uh, rare disease space, there are about 7,000 diseases or even more within the rare disease space. And uh, of, there are very few treatments available in that space. If you look at the um, past eight years, the FDA has approved more than twice as many drugs for rare diseases in the, in, than in the previous eight years. And you can see that for 2018, there were about 58% of uh, products uh, which were being approved for rare or often uh, diseases, and in 2019, it was 44%. That is also reflected in the approvals in Europe. Can you go to the next slide, please? Where um, we have from the OrphanNet uh, some data for products uh, which with, with rare diseases without an orphan drug designation, where you see about uh, 20 approvals in 2018, 
and 17 approvals in 2019. If you um, look at a, a presentation which was given by Hans Georg Eichler from the um, from the EMA, uh, from the new active substances centrally uh, authorized in the EU in 2018 and 2019, there were 73 uh, products. Of those 73 products, 28 were in the rare disease space, which is about 40%. Uh, of those, five were cell and gene therapies. And there's an expectation that in 2025, 10 to 20 products on, in, in this uh, category will be approved per year. And why do I mention that? It's simply because of the fact that we see a lot of activity going on in the gene and cell therapy for rare diseases. Next slide, please. If we then look at the hurdles which we have in order to do research and development in these, um, in these areas, well, Rare diseases are often a challenge. They don't have good predictive animal models. There is a limited knowledge of, uh, of the diseases themselves. Uh, we don't know the underlying biological changes, which is make it very difficult to, uh, to determine what kind of biomarkers are unknown uh, or endpoints which, which we want uh, to, to, to use in these trials. As Jane and Amanda clearly pointed out, there is a limited number of patients available. And most diseases are in pediatric populations. And pediatric populations pose additional challenges from a development uh, perspective. Um, also, it is, it is difficult to, dis to uh, assemble the dis uh, disparate patient cohorts, uh, which can be expensive and also time consuming. Frequently trials um, in terms of double blind control trials are not feasible. Uh, patients with rare diseases are not uh, always willing to accept the uh, placebo treatment. And as I indicated before, there are limited data, but there's also a high variance in the data progression of rare diseases. And Jane pointed that out in some of the examples she gave. Also, there's an absence of appropriate and validated uh, COA tools, um, clinical outcome assessment tools, uh, like patient reported outcomes tools or physician reported outcome tools. So next slide, please. So what are the hurdles for diagnosis and treatment? Well, many rare diseases are difficult and a challenge to diagnose. Patients are running from one patient, from one physician to the other in order to get an adequate diagnosis. And very often they need to consult several physicians before they get a correct diagnosis. And the, um, uh, it is frequent that incorrect diagnosis are obtained within the first five years of seeking treatment, which is not uh, for, not very good for the treatment in, in general itself. The um, rare diseases are difficult to treat. There's a limited availability in locations of treatments. Specialized centers are uh, spears occur on, uh, around the country. And there are many rare diseases which lack well-defined treatment guidelines. And there is also a variability of uh, treatment guidances uh, according to ge geography. And not last but not least, the accessibility of uh, new treatments can be a challenge as new treatments can be very, very expensive. Next slide. So if you then look at the ongoing hurdles and research, what kind of solutions do we have for that? Well, all potential solutions will only be feasible by full collaboration of stakeholders, which include data sharing, on multiple levels and on, on a global level. Um, data sharing is, is really critical as Amanda and also Jane already pointed out. Some in, examples of the solutions, are, and this is certainly not uh, extensive, there is an innovative approaches for locating and coordinating rare disease patients across trial sites. The creation of guidance documents like the recent FDA guidance on investigational new drug submissions for individualized antisense oligo nucleotide uh, drug products. But last but not least, the collection and aggregation of data on rare diseases in order to better understand progression and variants like the RDCA DEP initiative, which we have heard about uh, in the pre preceding two uh, presentations. Next slide, please. So the, um, you already have seen this slide before. Um, some of the people who came on board uh, in, in this meeting a little bit later, they may not have seen this. So the Rare Disease Cures Accelerator Data Analytics Platform, as we call it, the RDCA-DEP, 
is intended to serve as a neutral independent data collaboration analytics hub, hub to promote the sharing of critical important data across rare diseases in order to accelerate the understanding of disease progression and optimization of clinical trial design and development. Dr. Billy Dunn from the FDA, when we launched this initiative in September 2019, uh, which is uh, the, the, the funding is coming from the FDA, um, together with the NORD organization, he indicated uh, and he used an algo, an algo for, for this and um, look at cars in, an, in a parking lot. He doesn't want only to uh, be able to combine the cars with the same brand. He also wanted to be able to, to combine the cars with the same color. Um, but also the same models and, and, and same features as some of these cars have. So you need, in order to be able to do that, a quite sophisticated and, and a database uh, uh, which, we, which we are building, as you heard. Next slide. So we can not do this alone. And so CPAD in itself is a global organization, and Jane already pointed out that we are an organization a non-profit organization which are operating in a pre-competitive uh, space uh, where we are um, trying to develop or we're developing um, drug development tools which can speed up and, and, and reduce the cost of drug development. Um, the CPAD collaborates globally with, uh, with a number of uh, uh, stakeholders. Um, we, are, we have more than 80 pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies in our uh, collaborations, more than 34 nonprofit and research foundations, more than 11 government agencies, and more than 1,600 uh, scientists across uh, the globe, and uh, more than 20 academic institutions. Go to the next slide, please. So what we are doing in these collaborations, as um, um, Jane already pointed out, we have uh, a number of um, uh, qualifications of these uh, regulatory qualifications of these tools, which we have been able to obtain. And um, so with the FDA, we have um, uh, six qualification decisions, one fit for purpose endorsement, seven letters of support and similar uh, in the EMA. Uh, in, the, um, in Japan with PMDA, we only have for now one qualification decision. Uh, if you look at the different uh, tools which we're developing, it's the clinical trial simulation tool, Jane already talked about for the Alzheimer disease, but also um, we have an, uh, uh, in, for the EMA a qualified model based uh, Alzheimer disease biomarker. Um, we got um, uh, letters for support from the FDA and the EMA related to model based um, Alzheimer disease biomarkers and pre dementia clinical trial simulator. So the um, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go through all the different uh, achievements which we have had, but the um, CPAD organization over time has been able to uh, show that we can um, get the regulatory qualification of, uh, of, of the drug, novel drug development tools, uh, which certainly have an impact on the, um, the speed of development, but also on the patients. And if you look into our last annual report, you will see about six impact stories related to patients. Next slide, please. Also, we are active in Europe and um, we have uh, in the moment a structure in, uh, as in, in Dublin. This is a for-profit structure, con contrary to the non-profit structure which we have in, in, in the US. And the main reason for this is that uh, we obtain a, a small, medium-sized enterprise status at the EMA, which permits us to re reduce the cost of our uh, interactions with the EMA related to scientific advice. As you know, scientific advice in, 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 uh, in the EMA can be quite expensive. It's about 90,000 euros per scientific advice. And if you are a small, medium-sized enterprise, you get a reduction of about 90% uh, in, in these fees. Now, um, it is quite not understandable that as a non-profit organization, you are, you are not able to get any reduction in, uh, in the fees. Uh, nevertheless, the CPAD organization is also to, to trying to set up a non-profit structure in Europe, and that will be probably closer to the, uh, to the EMA um, as it is uh, now based in, in, in Dublin. 
So we are also looking to expand our footprint in Europe, and uh, we has, have established a relationship with key partners, um, like, for example, the Center of Human Drug Research in Leiden, um, which, with, with, which, with whom we have signed a uh, MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, and the European Joint Programme of Rare Diseases, among others. Um, there are other uh, organizations which we collaborate with as well. We are getting the funding in Europe from the IMI, and in the moment we have two funds, uh, two, two grants which we have obtained from the IMI. One is related to the to tuberculosis research, uh, which is building on the tuberculosis research which we already did in uh, the US, uh, which was funded by um, a, fund, a grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And we um, um, have a grant in order to look at the projects uh, from the IMI and uh, to see which ones of those we could bring to uh, regulatory qualification. Next slide, please. So, as I indicated before, we are working with the NORD organization, which is the, uh, um, the, the national organization for rare disorders in uh, the US. Um, they have a number of projects and programs ongoing. Uh, one of the things, but uh, one of the databases they developed is a patient registry database, the IAM REA database. They have more than 300 member organizations. They have more than 15,000 REA uh, action network members, and um, they um, have about uh, 1.3 million website visitors each month and have an annual meeting every year uh, where they uh, showcase uh, and, and talk about the progress within the, uh, the research and, and, the, um, and the activities within the rare disease communities. Next slide, please. So, with, in conclusion, um, I want to uh, reiterate the, um, the importance of the possibility to share data uh, together. As Amanda also pointed out, we won't be able to make any progress in public health and, and, and particularly related to rare diseases if we are not able to share data together. Uh, there are many, many, many rare diseases, as we uh, pointed out earlier, it's about more than 7,000. We won't probably be able to deal with all the, rec all the rare diseases uh, as a single organization. And we need the collaboration with other organizations like the European Joint Programme for Rare Diseases. But we will, be, we'll, we will certainly need a way in order to, across the globe, um, come together in order to share those rare uh, data from rare diseases uh, together in order to bring, bring it to insights which we can use to stimulate uh, development in these, uh, in these diseases. So from an overall perspective, we want to increase the utility of the patient level data and accelerating drug development and to get novel therapies to patients faster. With that, I want to thank you for the attention and want to uh, bring it forward to the next uh, presentation, which is uh, from Daria Yulkowska, um, who is the head of the um, uh, uh, European Joint Programme of the uh, Rare Diseases. So, Daria, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joseph. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to present here the collaboration that we are developing between the EJPRD and RDCA DAP. Next one, please. So maybe let me start with uh, just stopping for a second about uh, and presenting what actually the rare disease landscape is in Europe. And uh, of course, it did not stop after the creation of the European Joint Programme on Rare Diseases, but it was ex all these stakeholders are extremely important for the European Joint Programme on Rare Diseases. So in terms of healthcare, since 2017, we have the European reference networks that cover not only healthcare, but also research. Um, we have, of course, Europe or this with more than 800 patient organizations that, re that represent patient needs in uh, in Europe and beyond. Um, in terms of funding, of course, beside the national funding that is available for, for rare diseases, we also have the European Commission, but also a program which was the multinational uh, program uh, that was focusing on rare diseases um, 
on funding of rare disease research. Another important stakeholder are the infrastructures, the rare disease specific ones, like the Orphanet, for example, or RD Connect, or the recent um, rare disease registries platform that is created by the Joint Research Center uh, of the European Commission, but also the, the infrastructures like Iatris or ECRIN or BB BBMRI and Elixir that are not necessarily dedicated specifically to rare diseases, but are very important uh, for biomedical research and thus also for rare diseases. And then we have the strategic uh, level also with the European Commission, but also International Rare Disease Research Consortium. So all these stakeholders are extremely important and were very important for the creation of the European Joint Programme on Rare Diseases. Next one, please. So what is the objective of the EJPRD? I would summarize it maybe in one sentence. It's really to create the um, ecosystem for re to, to, to boost rare diseases, uh, rare disease research for the benefit of patients. And this goes through the integration and collaboration between those different stakeholders um, through enhancement of the tools, infrastructures, uh, mechanism or, or programs that were already created of, uh, through their expansion and of course, through the creation of the new ones. Uh, to, to be able to, to accelerate rare disease research uh, and the creation of, um, of therapies and, and benefits for rare disease patients. Next one, please. So today, EJPRD uh, brings together more than 100 30 institutions from 35 countries, so covering Europe, but also Canada, uh, Israel, or Turkey. Uh, we, uh, we bring different, as I mentioned, all those different types of stakeholders that I already mentioned. Um, altogether, the budget of, uh, of the program, which is a five-year program, uh, goes above 100 million euros. It is co-financed by the European Commission and the member states. And taking into account that many of our partners are networks themselves, we can say that today EJPRD is covering about 85% of the European rare diseases community. Next one, please. So in general, the, the EGPRD, and I'm going to focus today uh, most specifically on, of course, on the data part, but this is just to show you that under the, um, uh, the overarching coordination and, and specific transversal activities, we have four types of activities dedicated to funding, to capacity building, training and empowerment, to the acceleration of the translation of research and therapy development and clinical studies, but also to the coordinated access to data services and tools. And this is what we call the virtual platform. And this is what I'm going to focus on today as this collaboration also with RDC DAP is very much around the specific virtual platform that we are creating. Next one. So this is just to show you the, the common, common characteristics, but also um, uh, the, the, the common characteristics, but also on the, um, uh, the differences that I would say that actually are also very strong points and the, the, that help us also to initiate uh, the collaboration. So of course, both RDC ADAP and EGPRD are very much focused on, on data sharing, on enhancing of data sharing, on the fair principles and standardization uh, for the benefit, of course, of, of rare disease community. But as you can see here, there are a few differences. So for example, EGPRD operates um, at, le at least at present under the federated model. Um, uh, in We are sharing different types of data or making data available for analytics, but do not have necessarily the specific regulatory grade uh, format that is uh, that is uh, characteristic for, for, for CPATH and RDC DAMP. Uh, we also together, uh, so we, we have come Common characteristics like, uh, of course, focusing on understanding of rare disease progression, developing dedicated tools. Um, but as I mentioned already, uh, EJPRD also goes, uh, let's say, beyond this this data part uh, through um, the development of dedicated rare diseases research, networking, training, and funding uh, schemes uh, for the rare disease community. Next one. So let me tell you a few words about the virtual platform of data tools and resources of the EJPRD. Next one, please. So the virtual platform, of course, 
as I already mentioned, it's a federated. Uh, so it, it federates different types of resources, uh, catalogs uh, that can be ready specific or not. It is, of course, uh, created in the standardized format, um, GDPR compliant. We are working on its sustainability and, of course, its quality assessed. And, of course, all uh, elements of, of the platform are, fair, are, are applying to the FAIR standard, meaning that they are findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. Next one, please. So how do we do that? Um, actually, it is based, so the creation of the platform is really based on a very close collaboration with the user community. So we work, of course, with, with rare disease researchers, with the European reference networks, with patients. And it starts with, uh, so the, the, the work is being done based on a specific use cases, like, for example, how to count patients with a specific condition that seems to be very simple, um, I would say, in, in terms of the idea, but actually is quite complicated, especially if you think in terms of, of, uh, of um integrating different data, uh, different data sources that are also not necessarily right disease specific. Um, we also are focusing on how to, for example, explore and so use the different types of catalogs, how to make the consent machine readable, or how to use multi-omics data for diagnostics and the identification of drug targets. So all that is being done, first of all, through the enhancement of the existing resources. As I mentioned, not all resources that are integrated in the virtual platform are necessarily rare disease specific. So they have to be translated, let's say, into rare diseases language to be rare diseases uh, friendly, if we can say so. They also have to be improved in terms of interconnectivity. Uh, so specific also ontologies uh, and, and standards are also applied here. It is important that at the level of the metadata, of course, there are some common models that allow to link different data to exchange and to exchange them through multiple IT systems. And we are also developing a dedicated discovery tools that help to explore those resources that are available, um, as well as the standards. And uh, we also created a rare disease port for exploitable pathways uh, to enable multi-omics analysis um, of, of data and going beyond or to accelerate diagnosis. Next one. So this is what the what the, the the next steps of the virtual platform. So as you can see here, there are multiple levels. So we have um, different types of resources. Uh, so for example, we, we we through the through the platform we can find registries, biobanks. Uh, we are also connecting uh, animal models and and send lines. Um, uh, you can also uh, find and uh, you can also find and deposit uh, data. We work very much on the standardization of the resources and uh, other elements. So, so this is really a progressive work and this is what is being expected uh, to be achieved in 2021. Next one, please. So just we, we can say that even though this platform is still, still being built and we can say that the kind of a beta um, uh, level uh, is now available, for example, for the researchers who are interested in, uh, in accessing the platform, we can already say that it is becoming a reference because of the fact that we very closely collaborate with the European reference networks and especially in the creation of the registries uh, for, for the European reference networks. We already improved many different catalogs and infrastructures. We also have an a national alignment, so many um, many countries already aligned with the standardization that is being used also for, for the rare disease uh, virtual platform of the EGPRD. Um, we also have uh, the, the, the platform and its standards is being also now notified through the European, uh, through the calls of the European Commission or even the IMI and the great collaborations like we are, uh, like of which we are talking today, like the one with, with the CPATH and RDC ADAP are also for us, um, let's say, uh, a, a, a sign of, uh, of of the importance of the work that we are doing. Next one, please. So let me just show you a, a, an example of what we are currently working on, for example, with RDC ADAPT. So this is done through a joint pilot uh, project uh, that is actually focusing on, um, let's say, connecting or trying to see how we can how we can work together in terms of standardization and the connection between the CDISC model and the models that are being applied uh, by the EGPRD in terms of ontologies. So the pilot project is focusing on uh, the data sets from polycystic kidney disease on uh, on on our side, on uh, on uh, uh, on both sides. So on the side of the of the 
HAPRD through the uh, European Reference Network on Kidney Diseases. It's registry with 850 um, uh, with 850 um, uh, entries, and uh, the more than 200 uh, for 4,000 from from the RDC DAP. So the idea is really to use the federated approach that is being uh, used uh, by the EJPRD um, to make the data sets and re registries interoperable. So this is connected. Uh, this is very much focused on the gen generic data elements that are being um, that has been applied by the EJPRD. And the idea is, of course, to allow the query data between the, those two different resources and to see how the also uh, how we can make the both ontologies um, speak to each other. So this, of course, this pilot uh, can be also applicable uh, to other rare diseases. Next one. So the other two uh, opportunities that I would like to speak about. Next one, please that for which we started the also the, the discussions are first of all uh, the collaboration in the methodological and regulatory space because the EJPRD has launched uh, three demonstration projects that focus on validating of novel methodologies in small population and clinical trials and we are also working now on the innovative methodologies projects so this is definitely something that is um, uh, in alignment with with the work of of uh, RDC DAP and and CPAT especially in terms of the collaboration also with their regulators and European regulators and another uh, also important uh, collaboration is the one um, where uh, that we are now developing on the European reference network registries informed consent and the work that EJPRD is doing in terms of, let's say, uh, facilitating and uh, of the of uh, of the implementation of the informed consent uh, and also sharing of data uh, between the registries, but also uh, in Europe within Europe, but also between uh, European, uh, let's say, European Union and and, and other countries uh, from uh, from the outside. Next one. So this is just to summarize that EGPRD, we consider the EGPRD really as a single entry point. I talked today only about the, uh, the data. Uh, but as you can see here, it is really uh, also a very valuable tool and support for researchers, clinicians, patient policy makers, and of course, international partners. And so next one, please. I encourage you to, to go to our website and of course you can also contact us through our host, um, help desk. And thank you very much. And I, I'm happy to, to give back the floor to Tony and uh, to, to the discussion on questions uh, from the chat. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Daria. So thank you. It's, it's been a fascinating uh, hour and 15 minutes. So thank you to Amanda, to, to Jane, to, to Joseph. Well, I think there are many questions. Um, by the way, if you want, please feel free to to turn your camera on, uh, just if uh, you feel if you feel like. Okay, that's okay. Uh, I think there are several questions that we can uh, we can discuss all together. But um, I think the key word for this uh, for this uh, meeting is sharing, because that, that has been kind of the key word for the development of the agenda of rare diseases. And then we were talking about sharing knowledge at the beginning. And now finally, we are sharing data and we are moving forward really, really fast. But I would like to, to, to ask you a couple of questions first about some uh, conceptual elements of the process of sharing. And one, the first question goes to, to Amanda, probably, or the others, please feel free to participate, um, about how to, how to manage issues related to the uh, using a specific standards for sharing data and, of course, um, uh, being consistent with the ontologies. And a very important question that you mentioned, the issue of verification of the, of the primary uh, data sets. Amanda? Sure. Um, that's a deep, that's a really deep subject. And in fact, I think we could take more than the 15 minutes to discuss <laughs> just, just those things, right? But I, I think a couple of things. First, I'm reading the question about validation of the incoming data. And, and so validation is a little bit open to interpretation in, in our field and what we're talking about. But I will tell you that 
We have 15 years of experience at CPATH in getting regulatory endorsement for models. And the way that we do that is by really extensive um, tracking and provenance of data, meaning that if we acquire data from a clinical trial, we have um, a, an open code repository where all of the code that we use to map the data, for example, or um, modify the data in any way. And an example might be that a drug is misspelled and we correct the spelling, right? Um, but all of the provenance is available and open and available to regulatory bodies. The model itself, all of the code that is used to develop, for example, a clinical trial simulator, that is submitted as well for regulatory endorsement. So we act almost as if we are a, a drug company and we're going through the process of a clinical trial. We have these very close relationships with regulatory bodies, including the EMA and the FDA. And um, that's something that I think is quite different from an academic study, right? Because we have this deep experience with how to go through the regulatory process. And that really ensures that whatever model we're submitting, they have to be quite comfortable that the data are valid and that the model itself is valid. And then I, I think probably I would cap off that topic by simply saying that science is a continuous learning process, meaning that this might be the best model available today based on the data that we have, but we are also adding data as we, as we can acquire access to data, we're adding data and refining models. So that's an important point to make as well. And then, then the topic about ontologies and standards I mean, that's one of the reasons that I'm so excited about the collaboration that Daria has talked about is that um, we have deep expertise in the concept of CDISC, especially those SDTM data models for sharing and um, archiving data. We have deep experience and have actually written many therapeutic area user guides on behalf of the CDISC organization. So we're sharing that experience in um, uh, data standards with the EJPRD group that we're working with, and they're giving us some expertise in ontologies. But we do have plans to um, endorse a particular set of ontologies. And I think that that's something that we're hoping to do with EJPRD because we believe that it should be collaborative and community driven, right? But we want to endorse the use of particular ontological um, ontologies and particular data standards. And, and actually, I think another topic that she mentioned was the use of common data elements and, um, you know, common data models. That's a challenge that's ongoing, especially if you're talking about a federated data model. It means that everybody has to sort of cooperate and use the same types of data models. Um, I, I would love to uh, give a follow-up discussion about ontologies and um, semantic interoperability in and of itself, but I think that sort of covers generally the question unless we have follow-up. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that we are going to need another webinar in the future because there are, I mean, I, I got the feeling that we just opened the box and you yes. know, yes. may cover inside. So uh, along this line, I think another conceptual barrier, uh, conceptual uh, issue we, we, we need to face, and, and I would really like to, to know what your perspective is, and also including Daria in this question, and, and, and Jane and Joseph, of course, is that we are, we are all aware that uh, uh, duplication, uh, duplication is, uh, is something that we have, duplication of data is something that we have to take into consideration, and in particular, uh, the presence of one patient's data across platforms. Actually, mm -hmm. if someone asks one specific question, um, not only a duplication of data, but also uh, duplication of initiatives, because there are already initiatives. And uh, one of the participants asked, for instance, about potential overlappings or complementarities with a rare X initiative. Um, what's your perspective about this, uh, this challenge? I'd open up it as well to have Jane add comments. We have a memorandum of, of understanding with RareX and with, uh, we're working very closely in partnership on RDCA DAC with the National Organization for Rare Diseases. Uh, we're open and collaborating with anyone who has anything to offer in the rare disease community. I think um, as far as overlap goes, CPATH's mission is very focused on regulatory processes, meaning that we're hoping to really enhance and facilitate processes that lead to new diagnostic tools or new therapeutics. Um, and that's something that makes us stand apart quite a bit. Many of the organizations that we work with are actively trying to collect data, for example, in patient registries. And that's a place where RareX, for example, and Nord, they both really shine. So 
I think that what we're hoping to get from this community is just that we're all working in our own, um, we're all doing our own work and in our own specialty areas, but that we're also very collaborative and sharing in every possible way. So we're hoping to um, build, we have discussions going on with um, RareX about accessing patient registry data that they have built this beautiful platform that actually is very focused on the individual patient being able to upload their records. But obviously Jane mentioned, and, and I also covered that we aggregate data from multiple sources. So we're not collecting data and that makes us yeah. quite a bit different. I think the yeah, only Jack place, Go, sorry, one last point. The only yeah. place where there's yeah. uh, the only place where there's overlap is that we're both housing data for rare diseases, but that's easy to overcome by sharing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Jane, uh, uh, would you do, do you accept working with incomplete data sets? With incomplete data sets, absolutely. Yeah, um, recognizing that the rare disease community is constantly generating new data and collecting additional data, and we're very interested in longitudinal data. So the way we're set up at the moment is if we can take a tranche of data that's available now from an organization and then in a year or two years, depending on the frequency of data collection, um, get an updated data set, either the whole thing again or just the new data and keep adding to it. What we're not set up to do is take data patient by patient. OK, today I entered some more data and tomorrow I'll enter some more. That's where we would part partner with the Nord registry system or any of the other systems out there in the world. Amanda mentioned RareX, but we're talking to eight or 10 different groups okay. for collecting data to try and bring in data from all of those platforms, either through federated access or actual transfer of data. So I think that you managed to, to definitely to, to, to break the barrier of the Atlantic Ocean because your financial and business model is really fascinating. I think you're really moving forward and there is an amazing perspective for having a strong impression in Europe. What's the what's the strategy? And actually, one of the one of the uh, one of the attendees uh, asked specifically if we want to establish from one one specific collaboration, should we contact the core group of uh, in in the U.S. or should go to the uh, uh, European uh, brand? I'll let Joseph ref um, answer that in more detail, but I think it will depend on the nature of the co uh, collaboration. A number of our individual disease consortia are um, based, based out of uh, the US because that's where most of our scientific staff are. But for the rare disease platform, um, the data center will be in Europe. And again, I think it would mostly come to a common email and common people who are working across both organizations. But if there's a specialist question for EMA, that might be more appropriate to go through the European offices that set up. And Joseph, I think you can talk about that in a lot more detail. Yeah, well, thank you, Eugene. I, I think it's a little bit too early to talk about that because we are setting up uh, uh, the structure in, in Europe. So the nonprofit structure is not being set up yet. It will probably take place this year. Um, we are hiring in a, um, a person for regulatory policy and uh, regulatory sciences. Um, and that person hopefully is on board in the beginning of March. Um, and then we are looking for a managing director. At the moment, we have an interim managing director uh, in, uh, in Graham Hick, uh, Hickson. And so um, um, that person we hope to have on board also in the middle of the year. We have a couple of people working on the TB uh, data activities in Dublin. Um, so they are data scientists. And um, uh, we are expanding that group as well. Um, but um, how that group then will evolve in the next year, that is something which we will further have to determine based also on the different ad additional activities which we can do within the European space. Um, but most of, so all of the connections in the moment for the RDC ADAPT should go to the, uh, to the uh, group in, the, in, in, uh, in Tucson, Arizona, which is where we are headquartered. Uh, so, uh, Daria, you, you, you already expressed the, the clear interest of the AGPRD in est establishing collaborations with, uh, with this initiative. So, uh, what, what should be the next milestone from your perspective? What should be the next step? So I think that the, first of all, I mean, we, we have this already this, this collaboration that started with the, with the pilot case. We have other that are in the pipeline. I think that for, for both initiatives, it is extremely important, you know, that we, 
uh, that we continue on this path and there are many other ways in which we can collaborate. I think, you know, the fact that EGPRD also represents, for example, um, the, or allows the quick access, for example, to all the 24 European reference networks, to the very fast connection also with, with patient organizations, to different research organizations. It's also a, a great advantage, I think, in terms of the collaboration with RDC ADAP and, and CPAT, because it means, you know, that in one place you can have an access, fast access to, to different stakeholders. And of course, then um, maybe initiate individual um, uh, collaborations if, if this is at the end what is uh, what is needed. But I think that the role also of the EGPRD is not only you know to be the only and unique collaborator, but also the accelerator of the, of the access and 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 uh, to to make it faster to the rare diseases community in Europe. Yeah, I like to suggest uh, Daria and and, and and Jane, of course, uh, Joseph and Amanda, that maybe in a few months because. Clearly, we are in a moment in which CPAF is uh, is kind of uh, accelerating the progress of, of this initiative, and also, uh, you know, uh, it has experienced an enormous progress over the last year. Maybe it would be very interesting to meet again in after a few months, just to explore how this collaboration is being built and identifying novel areas for for progress. Because, uh, I mean, I'm working for thirty years in my life during thirty years of my life in the field of rare diseases as a scientist, and the key word for me is sharing. Definitely, if we have been able to provide some treatments and some uh, some cures to patients with rare diseases, because we've been absolutely determined to sharing our knowledge. So sharing data is going to be definitely the key element for the future. So, uh, well, I think it's uh, it's time to, to wrap up. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been a fascinating, a fascinating uh, hour and a half. There are many questions that uh, I think the speakers um, answer most of the questions. We are going to send uh, a link to all the participants so you can review the contents of the presentations. Um, also, there are the specific uh, email contacts for the speakers so you can address directly to them. If you have question. And I'm really special collaboration being is going to be built in the future. Thank you very much, everyone. Yes, thanks, thank everyone. And, Bye -bye. and we'll follow up with an email answering additional questions from the chat, I believe. Yep. Yes, indeed. So uh, all the participants will get answers to all of the questions sometime in the next couple of weeks, in addition mm -hmm. to the slides and recording. So thank yeah. you all very much. I think we lost Tony at the last possible moment, but thank you to all the speakers and thank you to the audience for your great questions. Yes. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.